Hello and welcome to Checking the Vitals, a podcast powered by Specialty Care. I'm Todd Schlosser and today my guests are Jody, Jason and Richta, who are all surgical neurophysiologists at Specialty Care. In this episode, we discuss why they chose to go into interoperative neuromonitoring as a career, how they found out about and then subsequently joined the Specialty Care IONM training process, as well as how that training went and what they've done since graduating. Enjoy the conversation. Thank you guys so much for joining us here on Checking the Vitals. I really appreciate it. And I would like to start off with asking what it was that brought each of the three of you to the IONM program at Specialty Care. So, uh, Richta, do you mind if you kick it off and we'll just start with that sort of what was it that made you want to pursue this as a field and then sort of why specialty care? Yeah, sure. So I graduated from Michigan State, go green, with a degree (laughs) in human biology. I knew that I wanted to work in healthcare. I just didn't know how or where. So I took some time off because I ended up needing surgery for scoliosis, a spinal fusion. Okay. And through lots of research and talking to multiple doctors and surgeons, I learned about interoperative neuromonitoring. So after my surgery, I looked up companies that I wanted to work for and specialty care was definitely at the top of that. And that's because of their training program. So yeah, that's what brought me here. Do you mind if I just ask you a follow-up question really quick before we move on to Jody? Um, What was it about the training program, even before you started, that drew you to that? Um, One, it was definitely talking to Julie. Her passion was contagious. Yeah, it is. Also, they have a great success rate. The CNM is not an easy test to pass. And I wanted to go and be a part of a program that would help me pass it. That sounds like obviously a great path for you to take. Now, Jody, from what I understand, your path was a little bit different because you had your own practice as a chiropractor. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I was a chiropractor for 10, 11 years in private oh, wow. practice Okay. and reached the point in practice where, um, I just needed to not own a business for a while. Um, I just had gotten a little burnout with the business aspect of things, still loved patient care, still loved, you know, all the hands-on aspects to it. Um, but I was looking for a change. And so I actually, my son plays baseball with one of the director of operations sons. And so I just, in conversation with him, like, Hey, what is it that you do? Like, what's that all about? Um, it really piqued my interest. My undergrad degree is in neuroscience. Oh. And then I have all the neurology training from chiropractic. So it just seemed like a very natural fit and a very natural second choice or second step for me. Sure. Sort of a, a career change for you. A career change without completely losing everything that I'd worked so hard for all those years. You know, I was still able to use all my knowledge, all my information, all my education, um, and then added on to that of the clinical experience that I had gained um, that's been really useful in working with patients and working with having a better understanding of pathologies and what's going on with people. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to have some follow-up questions when we actually talk about the training program itself about like what kind of overlap there was, but let's come back to that. Okay. So Jason, uh, was it a similar story for you or did you come straight out of college to specialty care? Um, yeah, my story is actually pretty similar to Rick's minus the scoliosis <laughs> surgery part. Um, okay. <laughs> but yeah, I was just, so no major surgery was, for you. <laughs> yes, correct. Um, okay. But um, yeah, so I went to the University of Tennessee and was studying biomedical engineering. Okay. Because like Rick, I knew I wanted to do something in healthcare and have that um, direct contact with with patient care. Um, But I really was, you know, leaving my doors wide open to work in um, a number of different fields. So just during my senior year, I started researching different opportunities after school and um, yeah, just kind of randomly stumbled upon IONM. I had no idea what it was coming into it, but um, did a little digging into it and read about it. And um, yeah, just, you know, it sounded like a cool field, sent in an application. And then um, like Rick did, when I talked to Julie, that's when, um, you know, it really piqued my interest in the field. So it sounds like a lot, but all three of you had a, I talked to somebody about it and that's what got me hooked. So for Ritka and Jason, it was Julie, but uh, Jason, do you mind if I ask what got you to that step to get on the phone with Julie? Was it, you came across the website or you talked to someone at a hospital? Like where was it that you first ran into specialty care as a company? 
I think I found it on Indeed, actually. Oh, wow. Like, okay. It was a random thing. You know, I was looking up, um, yeah, again, a number of different jobs and specialty care just happened to be one of them. And um, I sent in the application, heard back from Julie, and we had a nice conversation. And after that, I was just, you know, dead set on it. So I'd imagine, obviously, you guys came in in the same class, right? So you guys did this all around the same time, Mm -hmm. uh, obviously at different stages in your life, but around the same time period. And you guys ended up in the same training class. So what was that training like? Rikta, why don't we start with you since (laughs) that's completing the circle? Sure. The training program was great. Um, We had a didactic portion in the classroom, which learning can't always be fun, but I like Julie made it fun. And yeah, right. And then we were all, we all became friends. We all hung out after, and then we moved on to a clinical portion in Nashville. And that clinical portion was my first time being in the operating room, not on the actual bed on the other side right. of things. And so as a non-patient, yes. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which I much prefer, but yeah, so that was, you know, that was eye opening, and it, that's when I knew like, this is, I'm sticking to this. This is what I want to do. It sounds like the training is, uh, actually pretty long. It's not just, you know, three weeks or two weeks or whatever. And it's both classroom training and actually going into the OR. Mm-hmm. At what point does it switch from all classroom training to cl- some classroom training and going into the OR? I think for our class, weren't we just strictly in the classroom for two weeks? And then I believe yep. we started our OR rotations after two weeks. And it was only one day a week. I think guys, right? One day a week that we went into the OR? It was one or two, I think. Yeah. It was two, but like one group went one day and the other group went the other day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, it wasn't until we got back to our markets that we were full time in the OR and then okay. doing classes online. Um and meeting up with you that way. So how long was it until you guys were full-time in the OR? I realize the training is still continuing during that time as you have like an online component. So once you're back in your home city, how does the training continue? Like what does that online component look like? We have webinars that we do with Julie and Christina Young, who is the other um, instructor. And then we also work with a clinical instructor in our home markets. And they help us with, you know, working in the operating room, learning about new surgeries and how to do the clinical aspect. And then Julie and Christina continue to teach us the didactic aspect. Okay. I think for me, I would be very nervous the first time I walked into an OR as a non-patient. I mean, I'd probably be nervous as a patient too, but that's just because I have those issues. But I think that... I mean, obviously you want to be prepared for that, but it was just two weeks before you guys go in for the first time. Do you think you were prepared for what you were expe- what was expected of you the first time you go into the OR? Afraid yes to move. No. You yeah. were afraid to move? I didn't touch anything. Yeah. I was afraid to move around the room. I was afraid that I was going to decontaminate or contaminate something. Um, sure. That, that was the, my most, most nerve wracking part was just kind of like, what can I touch? What can I touch? Where can I be? Where can I stand? How can I move without getting in someone else's way, but still getting what I needed to get done, done. You know, that was kind of, I don't know, overwhelming the first time in there. I can imagine. So I know that I would be for sure, very overwhelmed walking in for the first time. Uh, But do you think, you knew sort of going in what was expected of you that first day. And I, I, and I believe me, I realize that what's expected of you now, when you walk into an ROR is much, much different from the first time you walked in, you know, after two weeks of training, but do you think you were ready to go in after that first two weeks for the first time? We had a clinical instructor with us that we were yeah. kind of shadowing. And I think yeah. that helps a lot. You're not just getting thrown in there to do something. But yeah, you know, you kind of just shadow around and wherever they go, you go and whatever they touch, you touch, whatever they don't touch. And you definitely don't touch that. (laughs) Yeah. So So it's sort of like you have a built-in mentor the first time you go there. They don't say, these are all the things you need to learn, have fun. And you walk in there by yourself. Yeah. I think the expectations were very clear in terms Mm -hmm. of just don't break the sterile field. Don't touch something (laughs) you're not supposed to. Right. And you will have a great first day. Because I yeah. feel like a lot of your first days, just observing and watching the surgery, and you're, you know, watching the monitoring as well. But I feel like really the first week is just getting you acclimated to that OR environment. 
let's talk a little bit about that training program a little bit so that the first eight weeks that you're actually doing classroom training, because uh, I believe it was Richta who said it was it was sort of fun, as fun as learning in a classroom can be. So yeah. what sort of things were done that made it fun? Pardon oh, the rhyme. Julie had us do all sorts of games. I think we played Jeopardy. We did crossword <laughs> puzzles. And her jokes kind of grew on me, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. She'll be glad to know that. Yeah. <laughs> she loved to dance around, to keep us focused and learning at the same time of, you know, having fun because learning can be fun if, you know, you have the right instructor. Yeah. I've heard, and I've never seen it in the wild, so to speak, but I've heard that she has a very unique style of dancing. That is very fun. It does. So yeah. yeah. I hope to at some point witness that and hopefully get it on video. Unique is definitely the right word. <laughs> for, for dancing. Well, awesome. So you're with this group of, I believe you said your class was a size of about 10 people. Mm -hmm. So did you guys build like a friendship out of that group of 10 people that you still sort of talk to and sort of support each other? Yeah. I ended up rooming with someone from um, our cohort um, oh, yeah? in Rhode Island. And he today is probably one of my best friends and will be invited to my wedding and Aww. all my children one day. So I definitely <laughs> built a great friendship from this cohort and everybody else. I keep in touch with almost everyone, you know, we snap each other, our signals sometimes when they're cool and you want to show them off. <laughs> you actually are a traveler. So you probably meet a lot more people than I would say a regular sort of surgical, surgical neurophysiologist that when they come out. Yeah. So you are literally traveling around to sort of support teams in the field. Mm -hmm. What is your week look like? Are you gone weeks at a time or is it, a shorter period of time that you travel? How does that actually work? So it depends on the market. And COVID also played an effect. I didn't want to be yeah. flying all the time. So for a short period of time, when I was in Nashville, I ended up getting an Airbnb and just staying put there. I also did the same thing in Albuquerque. But right now, um, I feel a little bit safer flying. I got part of my vaccine. So nice. I'm doing, I fly out Sunday from home and then fly back home on Thursdays. Oh, so you're really only gone like four-ish days a week. Yeah. And that time, you know, I have enough time to support the team and then also come back and enjoy my weekend. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and this is sort of for everybody. Um, when did you guys finish your training program? October, 2017. Okay. So you guys have been out a while of the training program. So it depends. I think the training program is set up for a year because until you pass your CNM. So was that October 2017 when you finished your classroom training? Right. That's when we finished oh, up okay. in Nashville and went out. Okay. And then, yeah, you're right. Do we, I think everyone took their seeing him in August of 2018 or right around end of July. Yeah, August, I think I took him in July. July. Yeah. And I'd imagine that there was a pretty high success rate for that, for the cohort or for that class in general, right? So can you guys speak a little bit to that? Did you feel prepared for the seeing him when you finally took it? I felt extremely prepared. I think Julie and Christina did a wonderful job of getting us ready. I loved the app. I was on that thing all the time doing practice questions and just over and over and over. I think they did a fabulous job of getting us ready to take that test. And there's an, an app that actually sort of serves you questions that mm -hmm. might be on the test. Mm -hmm. Is that a specialty, specialty care thing or is that something provided by the I th it's called Exonify. I think it is an, an app that specialty care chooses to use. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. Yeah. But it's just a way to sort of prep you for the questions that you'll face on this scene. In. I was a little bit of a test knowing that I passed. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, when you walk out of there with the utmost confidence. Yeah. You almost don't need to see the results. You're just like, oh, yeah. I know I nailed it. I that. got this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, and I, listen, I've all throughout high school and college, had experiences like this. They were not as many as the ones I was like, I really hope this works out well for me, <laughs> but I know, I know that feeling. Yeah. So let me ask this. So it's been a little while since you guys passed CNIMS and have been full fledged surgical neurophysiologists. So what has happened to each of you across the past, really two, two and a half years of your career since passing the CNIMS? I, so I moved out to Rhode Island and I worked there for about two years. And then after those two years, I joined the travel team. And okay. then since then, I've been working on the travel team and, you know, helping out markets across the country. 
Yeah, so I came back to the Delaware market. Um, I cross cover with the Philadelphia teams and on the Pete's team. We're really fortunate in the Philadelphia area to have two world renowned Pete's hospitals. And so they have their own special team. So I go in and I help with them as well, which has been really interesting. Um, and so I've just been here uh, working with my team and helping where needed. And then, um, yeah. So I started out in the. Um like Baltimore, D.C. region. Okay. And I was there for about a year and a half before actually moving back to Nashville, which ended up being a really cool opportunity because um, I got to work with a lot of the new SN1s who are, you know, coming through the training program. Um, so it's always funny to, you know, see someone on their first day in the OR. And you see their bright eyes and they're nervous. Um, but yeah, it's really, it's really rewarding to, um, to get to work with some of the new guys. Well, and you're not too far removed from your first day in the OR. So I'd imagine that you, uh, you know, you are more empathetic because your first day in the OR was like two, three years ago. Yeah. How do you feel about specialty care in regards to like a career track is concerned. Is this a place you can grow into a leadership position if that is something that you choose to do? Obviously, it's not for everybody. Some people want to stay in on the clinical side and there's a lot of admirability mm-hmm. in that. But is this a place you could see building a career? Definitely, Ken. Um, I've been involved in training our newest SN1 and I really enjoyed that. Um, I am still working towards my next level of promotion just because of case variety and, and quantity that's necessary. Uh, so we're still working on that. But I, because of my previous degree as a chiropractor, I'm eligible for the diplomate, um, the DABNM. So I will be sitting for that at some point and then oh, awesome. um, would like to, to, you know, be able to use that. But I definitely think that specialty care has a lot available for people that want to do more or expand their responsibilities and expand their um, opportunities, whether it's in the training program or, or, um, you know, going up the management ladder or the technical ladder. I mean, there are a lot of options I think that uh, we can all take advantage of. Yeah, I um, have been working in all these markets and I get to work under some great clinical managers, directors, and I report up to Christy Kisner, who's our uh, region vice president of the South. So she's been a great mentor for me and, you know, helping me climb up that ladder, which I hope to do. So that's been great. I think specialty care has either you can go maybe leadership, but also clinical or, you know, go maybe towards like what Julie does. There's just so many great options and great mentors yeah. with that within mm-hmm. our company that can help you achieve your goals. Well, I think if there's anybody to brag about, and this is someone we can all agree on, it's that Julie is a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher of IONM. And I'm Absolutely. not just, you know, she's not holding into a, a gun to my head right now, I promise. Um, <laughs> well, I did yeah. notice that your um, video is turned off, so right. there's no way to verify <laughs> yeah. that. But yeah, we're, for it. yeah, exactly, Jody. <laughs> but um, yeah, she really, really did a, a great job making the class fun and keeping us engaged. Um, because some of the material can get pretty dry, but sure. I know every single day I was, you know, always happy to be in her classroom learning about new modalities or new procedures. But yeah, I, I would just want to give a shout out to Julie. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. She was also always available. I mean, I would email her questions at 10 o'clock at night when I was studying something on a Sunday night and she would get right back to me. Um, like she made herself available to us, which I really appreciated. And since leaving Nashville, she's been extremely encouraging. Um, I can only speak for myself, but she's been very encouraging to me in my career. Um, she asked me to speak at a national conference on a topic that I presented for my capstone presentation. And so that all came from her and her push and her encouragement. Um, so she's kind of, I feel like She's like this little angel on my shoulder when I get comfortable. Here she comes pushing me along. And like, Jody, why don't you go do this? Or let's try that. And I'm like, okay, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so she's been very um, invested in our success once we leave the SN1 program. And she, she yeah. sticks along. She, she keeps us a little cheerleader. I still jabber her every now and then whenever or I have not like even a troubleshooting issue. I go, Julie, what do I do? And she has an answer for everything. She, she knows everything. Yes. Yeah, she, 
She is incredibly knowledgeable. I, I obviously do not do the job that you guys do. And a lot of what you do goes over my head sometimes, but I seem to, when I'm talking to Julie sort of grasp what she's talking about, which to me is amazing. It's truly yeah. an amazing gift to be able to talk very clinical and very, very dense as far as what you guys do. It's not a, it's not a job that it's easy, easy, easy to pick up. Right. Uh, yeah. And mm-hmm. she has a way of explaining it that just makes sense, even to someone who's not necessarily in the job, yeah. which I think is an, is, is an incredible gift. Well, guys, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you for doing the job that you guys do every day. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you.